This is Jeff Towson at Peking University. This is part four of our discussion with Jonathan Wetzel, the urbanization uh, guru of McKinsey. And in, in the last couple of sections, we talked about real estate infrastructure. Uh, in this section, we want to talk about um, rural China, which is sort of often not something people think about a lot. But I guess the question to you is, what is the role of rural China within urbanization uh, in the past and going forward? Well, it's changing. I think for many years, Jeff, uh, rural China was kind of the safety net. Uh, it's kind of where, where everybody came from, for, for, for one thing. I mean, though, um, I think uh, back in the beginning of China's economic reforms in the 70s, uh, I think the rural population was probably like 80% of the country. So uh, it was you know, literally you know, the, the, where, where everybody was from. And still today, like in our class at, at, at Peking University, if you ask people, how many of you were born in the countryside? You get a few hands. How many of your parents were born in the countryside? You know, you know another like 20%. How many of your grandparents are born? And now you've got over 60, 70% of the room that's got their hands up. That's, that's un different from a classroom, say, in, in, in Boston, where you know, basically still no one's hands would be up as to how many, how many what, whether, whether they came from the countryside. So, it is where China comes from, but it's changing now because it isn't where China's going. You know, it's clear that everybody is moving to the cities and we're going to this urban environment. So the role of the countryside and the role of rural areas is a little different. Uh, for one, it's going to be uh, about the food. And so where do we, how do we feed the cities? And so the changing role of agriculture and the increasing productivity of agriculture is going to be a, a real, real issue. Um, and yet it's also still, you know, the source of a lot of Chinese culture, of Chinese you know, ways of thinking, uh, and that's going to be important to hang on to for China as we redefine what it means to be Chinese. For thousands of years, China hasn't been a village society where people basically lived in one small area and that's how they defined themselves. And even today, if you ask somebody in China, you know, uh, who are you? They'll say, you know, or I'm from this province, or I'm from this city, <laughs> and that's how they define themselves, even though they're living in wherever, Shanghai or Beijing. But that's the village society, and of course, urbanization kind of just dumps all that out and rips it apart. And that uh, there's no longer a village, <laughs> village gone. <laughs> so you have to rethink what it means to be Chinese. Uh, and that is where rural society, and so these values, you're going to hear a lot about this, about you know, wh who are we and how do we relate to each other as Chinese people. A lot of that's invested in the, uh, in the countryside. In the, in, so I think that's the importance of, the, of, of uh, rural society going forward. Um, but you know, China's countryside is, is, is vast. It has as much differences in the countryside as you find between the countryside and the city as well. So you can tell a lot of stories about it. <laughs> in terms of this idea of you know, China as a rural culture, at least historically, is that, to what degree do you think that's gonna persist? Um, I, mean, I, I think you said this well, to a large degree the country's been defined by the fact that everyone was living in farms, far more than I, I think any country I can think of. You know, even countries that are as large as China didn't have rural populations this large. Uh, how does that, I mean, can you point to a way maybe that's going to stay with the country as it becomes an urban country? Well, sure. Let's, let's talk, we can talk a bit of history, but also one, one parenthesis. I think India and China, really interesting comparison here. And those are probably the two big environments where you talk about kind of what is the nature of that balance because there's a huge rural population in India too. But let's talk about China. Um, I mean, Cultural Revolution, Mao set off the Cultural Revolution by saying that the uh, Chinese people were yijang bai zhi, it was a, a blank sheet of paper, <laughs> and you could rewrite it, and you could you know, just create the new proletariat you know, from scratch. And after about 12 months, he f they, everybody realized that that was not, in fact, the case, <laughs> that Chinese people had some very well-defined ideas about who they were and, sort of, and how they liked to interact with each other. And when you threatened that hierarchy, when you threatened that society, what you got was basically chaos. Uh, and so, hence the end of the Cultural Revolution uh, very quickly. So, I mean, in terms of an actual revolution. The, you know, so what was it? You know, what was that underlying template? Well, it is the things that go on in a village where you have to work together in order to survive. 
So the big difference I see between Chinese and Western culture is that in Western culture, typically the threat was the outsider, you know, was the invader, and that somebody would come and kill you, and so you had therefore had to band together to defend yourself. You didn't really like each other, but you know, you would you would get behind the walls and you'd fight off the invader. In the Chinese, that was not the problem. The problem was not the outsider. It was everybody inside. <laughs> too many people. China has too many people. So the question problem was really how do you work together? And so village societies were built off of how do we work together so that we don't all starve? Uh, and that was, so for example, in Guangdong, which is a rice-based culture, it was how do you use the water? Because you need to have three crops a year and you need to manage the water really carefully because if you don't, you only get two and then you starve. And so as a result, Malcolm Gladwell in his book says that it's provable that Chinese, that Guangdong peasant housewives are better at price negotiation and price sensitivity than any other housewife in the world because this has been thousands of years of figuring out how much money, how much water you could have. So their ability to calculate actually and hold a price in their head is much greater than say a housewife from northern China where you basically would use one crop a year of potatoes. You didn't have to have that sensitivity. So it's kind of fascinating sort of how deeply this runs. And um, so Chinese village society in that sense is going to continue to influence Chinese society. Uh, and what is it that, how is it going to do that? It's going to make them, well, maybe a little more price sensitive, <laughs> at least price aware. Uh, I think make them a little more conservative. Uh, typically in a village, you don't want to try too many new things because if you are experimenting too much, then you might, uh, might, might mess up the whole system and then you'll all starve again. Uh, and it will make you more respectful of, of, of community because you have to work together. And so in Chinese society, it's a lot about where do you fit, not how do you feel, but how, where do you fit? You know, what is your role? And so those kind of characteristics, you can say they might make China a little less innovative or more, uh, maybe a little bit more collective, a little less individual. But again, I mean, this is a tra tendency. I wouldn't say it's going to dictate anything. Uh, but it's, but it, does, it does reflect itself. For example, in behavior in Chinese subways. Uh, very little graffiti on Chinese subways. <laughs> uh, very little acts of random vandalism. <laughs> Uh, on Chinese subways. And, and you think about it and think about how many people are going through that subway and what stress they all have. I mean, compare that to any major Western city. It's very different. <laughs> I think this raises sort of, you know, this issue with rural China is, I think, centers now largely on agriculture as much as anything else. And that's role, the role in feeding the cities. I mean, how do you view sort of that relationship going forward? Um, really interesting question because the, the, I mean, the diet, first of all, is changing. I mean, China is becoming more protein intensive, which is the more energy intensive, uh, water intensive. So it means the, the demand for the, uh, the product, if you will, is just getting that much higher. And at the same time, China's arable land is, is shrinking with all of the urbanization. And, and I, you know, we talk about how the government made a one-time land grant. Well, unofficially, there's still conversion going on. So the amount of land that is unofficially becoming urban is increasing. So you've got a lot more stress on the agricultural system. But that just implies, wow, opportunities for innovation. You know, we can, you know, we got, we got demand here. So is there going to be a supply response? Can the agricultural uh, environment become more productive? And the short answer is, yeah, really it could. I mean, it's very under-mechanized, first of all. We sort of have, you know, like very small farms with very little, you know, replace, the Chinese mechanization is at the stage where we're replacing one family with one tractor. You know, that's, we don't have any mega farms. <laughs> so it's one family versus one tractor. That's, that's your choice. So that, uh, that's going to continue. Um, wrong kind of pesticides and fertilizers are being used. Uh, bio, and then biotech is just taking off in an incredible way. So what we've seen, one of the hottest areas of venture capital investment today in China is in agriculture. You know, whether it's about creating you know, a new version of a blueberry or, uh, you know, or you know, accelerate organic farming uh, or lowering, lowering the cost to the farmer of their fertilizers or pesticides through precision farming, knowing what to plant, where to plant, how to plant. Uh, you know, this, this is a big opportunity. So I think that you know, we're going to see a high-tech countryside. You know, it, might, it might take a few decades, but we're going to get there. Uh, and that's going to become a, 
you know, an opportunity for places in the countryside to become more specialized. So more, you know, we'll have like, you know, again, villages built around certain pieces of technology or certain pieces of the ag chain. Um, but it will also, you know, I think ultimately it does mean that we'll have fewer people in the countryside <laughs> and that it will be, but they'll be creating more value and there'll be opportunities for bigger companies to, to emerge there as well. So that'll be interesting. Thank you.